Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 35 of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. How are you feeling, Dan? You ready to go? We're about to launch in, I guess by the time this one comes out, we will have launched in five more markets, bringing our total to 10. 10 markets by June 1st. We're going 10 markets. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I think, yeah, I think this one's going to be coming out just, just after June first. We're going to be in ten total markets around the country. That is uh, officially, crazy. Officially you know, we time. we were in two markets, three technically last year. We pulled back, consolidated. I don't know what do they say? Get small before you get big. Kind of refined some of our systems. Yeah. And then within mm -hmm. <laughs> within a couple of months of launching to another market, we're back to ten. That's awesome. I didn't. I did not expect that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. But you know, things happen yeah. fast, and when you when you're taking deliberate action, yeah. right? That that's sort of what comes up. Um, but I mean, it, it's interesting too because if you look at the system that we've built out, like it's not actually that inherently crazy. I mean, it, it's once you have the basis of every business, I think scaling is just you know the same but mm. more, and then it's just sort of like finding out that middle management piece right. to <clears throat> tie it all together. Which I mean is definitely proving a challenge. It's more of like a business problem than like a real estate investor problem. But we're you know it's coming together pretty quick. And at this point, I mean, I'm confident that we can just keep growing for as long as we want to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's just uh, business growth and like how do you, uh, you know, employee management, and building the right team, having the right people, the best people you can get to grow with you that are just as motivated. It's definitely a lot of hard work where we're at right now. Um, yeah. But with that, yeah, they, just because the growth scale so fast. But it's been pretty cool to see the team step up and we're learning as we go in some of these things. But like you said, the real estate piece, we got that dialed. Like we can go and pick up properties in any city. I'm confident in any city, any state across the country. Now it's how do you do all of them all at the same time? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think what you said there is, you know, we're learning as we go is the biggest thing that so many people, especially when they're starting out, they tend to kind of be afraid. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, I don't know how to do this. You know, I don't know how to manage a rental or to flip a house or to do all those things. And I was like, well, we didn't either when we started. Yeah. And then you just kind of start and you figure it out. And it's like the markets that we're dropping into, I'm like, well, I don't know how to, you know, what like what the real estate situation looks like in some of these places. And I'm like, that's fine. But you know, the easiest way to start figuring it out is to start having conversations mm -hmm. with people and start shooting your shots, right? And we've built up enough of a sort of war chest now from, from running our business that we can afford to be making those stretches. And we go and we drop in there, we spend a little bit of money figuring it out, we miss some opportunities, we get some opportunities, but overall what it does, it forces you yes. to learn. You know, and it's basically, it's like paying for an education in the form of a business yep. expansion, right? And I mean, what, what's the worst gonna happen? You're gonna spend some money, you're gonna waste some money on marketing, you're gonna miss an opportunities, but all that shit's gonna happen anyway. Yep. So yep. you might as well do well, it. <laughs> to be honest, it's really not. You talk about the war chest being built up. Like we have our personal war chest, but it, it's not that hard to do this business and grow it. Like the, I don't believe in the no money yeah. down type real estate without everybody pitches. All the gurus pitch like you could you could start wholesaling with no money. I think you probably could. We've had this conversation. You probably could. It'd be very very hard. Um, however, like. Yeah we're growing and it doesn't take a lot to grow this business the way we're doing it. Yeah. Cause we right. have the systems in place. You're it right. takes it, a lot of skill, a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, but because our system is so dialed in on the acquisition side, it makes it just so much faster, so much easier, so much scalable. Yeah, exa exactly. And it's not like we're sitting on millions of dollars, you know, that we that we need to scale no. this thing, you know, significantly less yeah. than that, actually. I mean, if I was sitting on millions of dollars, I'd, probably <laughs> doing this, I would have so much liquid, yeah. I could just go and lend yeah. it out at 12% yep. and not yeah. do anything. Yep. But it, in, you're, you're completely right. And, you know, going and borrowing money from other people, which we did talk about doing at one point for expansion. We're like, what if we go and we borrow it? And we, you know, like pay terms or we offer these returns also to the people, then we're in debt and then we're obligated to make things work. Mm -hmm. 
right? Or we're on the hook. With this, I mean, we're taking our money, we're investing in our own learning opportunities and potential and investing in our own business. Yep. And ultimately, if a market doesn't work or a situation doesn't work, then, you know, we kind of step back and we keep, you know, march forward and make that money back yep. at some point instead of having to go to an investor. And this goes, whether you're flipping a house, you're going into a new market, you're bringing on a partner, make sure that you can, you know, actually walk the walk where you're going to do that and that it makes sense because otherwise what's going to happen is if you do fail, you're going to have to go and tell someone that you lost yeah. the money or that, you know, the, the terms of your agreement are going to change. And depending on that person, you're either going to lose a friend or you're going to get your ass sued. And those are not things that you really want to. Yeah. Want to and I'm just strong. I strongly believe in if you have the capital to grow something, you should use your own capital for a couple of reasons. One, you don't have mm -hmm. to go tell people you lost their money. Um, two, you retain all your ownership, all your profits, because you have the capital to do it. Now there's, you know, when you're talking about buying properties, of course, real estate is, you grow based on leverage, but we're talking about business growth, right? Taking on money mm -hmm. uh, from other people to grow a business. Like that's a whole nother ball game. And, you know, we've seen other people do that. Um, there's another guy that I just saw something he posted about raising $2 million to do his business. And I'm like, I hope you make at least $2 million you know, for your investor's sake, <laughs> for your right. investor's sake, right? You My know, in a business is, that might be low is. transaction, uh, low transaction cost, to you, or as far as revenue goes, too, that's like kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, and and it is always like a weird, questionable issue, especially because different circles we go in. But a lot of people raise money or they syndicate money for different things, and they're going off historicals, but that's not necessarily a guarantee of future yeah. success, right? And I understand, like. You know the investor the, the the big thing that always gets me is when people say well the investor understands their risk i'm like do they though <laughs> like honestly yeah i mean like i don't even understand my own yeah. risk half the time and then the person that's not even tied to the the runnings of the business they don't really know they're taking yeah. your word for it because you have personal trust yeah. with them you know whether that's like a personal friend of yours raising money or whether that's someone lending money to brandon turner because they trust him because he's hosted bigger pockets podcast Correct. Right, I gu I guarantee you, if if Brandon per Brandon Turner shit the bed on a project, people would go right. after him just like they would right. anybody else, you know. And he's not invincible, yep. you know. I, like like uh, people mm -hmm. make mistakes regardless of their their social status, right, and the yep. authority that they have. Yeah. Speaking of like investing, this is a, a tangent, but I saw a presentation this morning. I wish I could remember the name of the company. I'll I'll, I'll remember it. We'll put it in the notes, but. It's an interesting way to kind of do fractional investing uh, in in people and companies and real estate. So you can aggregate. So say you know people with a lot of money, but you don't have anything for them to invest in. Like a good example would be, say you're a real estate syndicator. And right now you have a couple million of dollars of your investors money on the sidelines because you just can't find a deal. Well, you can go to this platform um, and you can either post your deals or you can see other people's deals. And it doesn't just have to be in real estate. There's other ways to do it. But you can go and build your own diversified fund within private for private companies and real estate investment. So you can kind of the, there's a cap of like 25 million for uh, a, a single person to be able to do probably for some SEC requirements. But it's super fascinating. Only 25. That that's I know, I know, right? Because I mean, you know you're not sophisticated <laughs> like Wall Street, right? Uh, but no, it's very fascinating though. So say you have this lump of money, um, you can bring it to that platform, and you can actually build your own investment portfolio with these opportunities and options. It's like commoditizing these fractional investments, or what would appear to be fractional investments, and then you can bring people on and say, "Hey." You got ten thousand dollars. You can invest in my fund. I just created a fund where we're raising twenty five million dollars to invest in a diversified way across all of the. You could be in three different apartment syndications. You could be in Mike and Dan, our little business growth where we're taking on investors, and so you could do it that way. It's actually kind of cool. I'm interested to see how it turns out. That's super fascinating because really it's just arbitrage, yeah. right? Like like they're taking the debt from others and investing that debt in their own projects you know, like, like there's going to be like a spread cause they're going to give a guaranteed return to whoever's investing with them. And you just have to go find people that are going to yep. be. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a total arbitrage move and there's multiple like, layers of arbitrage, right? Yeah. You could just be a person bringing money or the platform itself is arbitrage because there's going to be fees and costs with it. Um, but then I think the benefit is, is for people with good ideas, but not rich friends. You know, you can bring them up there are good deals mm -hmm. and not rich friends. So you can start seeing it. And then, and then you start thinking about, uh, 
um, I don't know what they call it, like turning everything into a coin. You probably know this term where they're talking about basically everything's a, a, a I don't want to say Bitcoin, everything's a cryptocurrency. Um, and so yeah. then if, if your building or your business is a on a blockchain, then to sell it, you just kind of put it up for sale to the open marketplace and people just bid on it like that, right? It's just like, it's crypto yeah. cryptocurrency, whatever you want to look at. I don't, I don't know. There's a term for it. You probably know it, but. Well, well yeah, well, what they did back in 2018 is they did ICOs. So basically like an initial coin offering, which was basically a way, what they said was a way to a sell, pre-sell tokens of the company. It was basically like mm -hmm. an IPO, yeah. you know, in the stock market. Um, but what it really became was, oh, hey, we have this theory for this coin that we're going to launch. And they would go and they would build this really elaborate white mm -hmm. paper and this really elaborate plan. And they would go and they would raise $10 million through an ICO and then they would just run with them. Well, yeah, yeah, that's that's probably not um, a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So but, it's, and, oh, it's, but, yeah, it's called I mean, token, going, going tokenizing that, uh, everything. Tokenizing? Tokenize it. So your yeah, your real tokenized. estate, your your portfolio, your property could be tokenized. Um, and be sold as yeah. such. Yeah, I know it, that's that's a whole mm -hmm. other ball game that I'm not entirely sure if I believe in. Because I mean, so even that that business you're talking about, I wonder where they actually make money, whether it's on like the spread or if it's on the basically the top end of it, like if they have a margin or something. No, like I, I, I'm sure I'm sure it's a transactional thing, right? Just like just like most yeah, of these trading platforms, all it's all transactional based. Yeah, because it has some of those businesses, they're so sophisticated. And you see this a lot with tech startups too, where they'll have a deal that seems like it's too good to be true, but there's like a little area where they make money that's buried into it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, what is it, Instacart? You mm -hmm. know, this business that like you can order your groceries. So they have the, the best marketing scheme, honestly, where they're like $99 a year and you get unlimited deliveries. Like, why would you not do that? That makes so much sense. But I'm trying to think like, through you know, that. I've used delivery. Instacart, but I just thought you you paid for your groceries and they probably marked them up or something like that. And that's how they made money. Exactly. But most people don't realize that. Their average markup on groceries is 10 to 25%. Depending so do they the charge $99 right? a and year too economy. to be part of that? They for for Or you can pay like a delivery fee. For oh, delivery. okay. But otherwise what you can do is you can pay $99 a year and then they'll waive that and you get like unlimited deliveries okay. forever. I know someone recently that was talking about that and I was like, he told me this and I was like, there's no way that you can do that for $9 a year. It doesn't make any sense. So I just you know, did a quick Google. How do they make money? And sure enough, they mark up all the groceries, um, 10 to 25% on average, some items even more than that. And if it's stuff that's in short supply, they'll mark things up as high as a hundred percent. Right. Um, and that's where they make all their money. And I'm like, that's super genius. Cause I guarantee you that a large number of people that use that service have no idea how much the items are being marked totally up. especially if they're right? low, especially, low cost items like it's a 99 cent item they're marking up to two dollars yeah nobody cares right yeah it, exactly or, or they don't even necessarily think about it because they know like about what you know a bunch of bananas cost yeah. you know it costs like a dollar you know 50 cents or well, what, what actually were in inflation barriers probably cost six <laughs> right you know yeah <laughs> so, but but they, they know bananas cost six dollars and now if it shows up as you know six six dollars and 75 cents they're like oh that's just what they cost you even think wow. about it but the business is making all that money across fit and you do that across thousands and millions of users they're making you know what this money. reminds me of and it's a beautiful segue taxes yeah right <laughs> that's the, that's the, how does that uh, the government taxes? right they just they, they just put a the government just puts a little transaction fee on every single point of your dollar being spent up and down the supply chain. Um, and when you're moving large assets, taxes are important. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. you got to pay attention sure. to because you don't think about it when you're not making money. Like you're starting your real estate business, you're just hoping to make money, right? That's where we were. We didn't really care yeah. about taxes. But now for us, it's a big deal. And we, we've got some things that we're you know doing to hopefully grow our business while also reducing our tax liabilities because it does kind of become a problem. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and just like Instacart, they have the 
government has their tax budget and they will layer it with all these little things. And what you don't know is that, you know, Nancy Pelosi <laughs> cut for her insider trading is like oh, there in there and part of like, there the, is definitely, you know, <laughs> I a hundred percent agree. There's some weird backdoor channels. I don't know if it comes from tax dollars or how it comes in, but there's some backdoor channels to some of these politicians. Oh, oh, of course there is. What was it when they sent all that money to Pakistan was it like last year or something? And there was like, it was like, 1.5 billion dollars or something for like, rights. <laughs> you know, just, just like, just like, well, yeah. And then they, and then those women rights groups has to donate 500 million back to the <laughs> democratic or Republican parties, you know, DNC or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. It's but, a scam. Yeah. That, yeah. Good. It's all a scam. Yeah. Good segue though. So that's what we we're going to talk about for our educational portion. Um, this episode can be slightly longer educational portion. There's a lot to cover, but it is something that people in our instant investor program have asked us about kind of a lot is how to deal with taxes um, and uh, kind of like setting up mm -hmm. your, your entity and yourself to be tax advantaged when you start making fast yeah. stacks as a real estate investor. Um, and it is something that's kind of just talked in the real estate community as a whole because it does have a lot of income potential. And usually that does come in waves that are much yeah. larger. And it has a lot of tax estate. advantages if you do it right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So after we get back, a uh, quick note about the Instant Investor Program, and then we'll talk some taxes with you guys. Right. So perfect. Be right back. The Instant Investor Program is our 12-week group coaching program, which includes a self-driven course and access to our private investor community. We will take you through the full process of how we find our leads, how we market, how we do our sales and follow-up, and how we determine the best strategy for every opportunity that comes our way. On top of that, you will also join a community of other like-minded investors nationwide that are all marching towards the same goals, and you'll have direct access to Dan and myself so you can continue learning and growing with us as we continue to adapt and grow our business. So whether you're a new investor or already established, our systems can help take you to the next level. So if you think you might be a good fit, go to the instantinvestorprogram.com and schedule a call, and we can have you talking to motivated leads in as little as two weeks. All right, Dan, taxes. I know this is kind of your jam. I know nothing about taxes or finances <laughs> or books. My role in our business is just to create an absolute shit show of paperwork yeah. and uh, financial disaster and make you figure out how to go to jail. <laughs> I don't know so, if I figured that out yet, but we'll we'll keep trying. I mean, like, I'm I'm not I'm not doing this from a prison yeah. cell yet, so you must figure. One thing out one thing I do know from personal experience is it usually takes the IRS about two years to come back to you if you made a mistake, and so you get two years of fees. <laughs> I've heard that. I've had that happen to me a couple times. Innocent mistakes. Innocent yeah, I, mistakes. I, I um, yeah. I, maybe we should just start really quickly with like entity structure because there's a couple different things to talk about there for reducing taxes. So for and it all, it all it's also like the most basic thing that you can do from yeah. the start before you're making like yeah, big and money it, to bring your um, you know your tax yeah, burden down like really yeah and you kind of step into it too. So the LLC limited liability company is what everybody pretty much it uses nowadays for any small business. There's a ton of other entities prior to the LLC. This is a little history lesson, but when the LLC came out, it kind of made them not as useful because the LLC captures so much and it does limit your liability. Um, and it's just a pass through entity. So that means if you make money in an LLC, uh, it just passes down to your uh, 1040 or your, your, your taxes, right? It doesn't get taxed like a C corp, which is what everybody's always kind of benchmarking towards. The, a C corp has an income tax, and then the owners and the shareholders pay taxes on their income after that. Once it's distributed out, so it's double taxed. LLCs don't have that. Uh, but the main point I wanted to bring up in that because that's where you're probably going to go. So if you if you're going to buy a re rental property, everybody always says put an LLC if you can um, because that's limiting your liability. It has nothing to do with taxes. You're still going to. Uh, if you own the property with a partner, you're still going to have a partnership return. It's all going to pass through to that to your 1040. Uh, if it's just you as a person, it's all just going to pass to you. It's not really a, a big deal. But as you do start making, you know, semi-significant income, and that doesn't have to be a lot, but say, say you make a hundred thousand dollars in your wholesale business, um, that's when you want to talk to your accountant and talk about what an S corp election can do. So you you start out with your LLC. You look back over the year and you say, wow, I, I kind of made some money this year. And, and you're, you can make that S-Corp election before the end of the year for tax purposes. And what that allows you to do is take a minimum salary 
from the business. It has to be reasonable. I shouldn't say minimum reasonable salary from the business. Well, reasonable for your role that you provide, there you go. right? Which, which is super up for, um, question. Yeah. I mean, cause obviously if you own a business, it's so like we pay ourselves what $36,000 a yep. year base, $3,000 a month. Um, but you know, it's like, but if you go and you're like something that's high skill, and you're like, I'm gonna pay myself thirty six thousand yeah. dollars a year, and they can just go and look and be like, well, people that are in that role make a hundred thousand dollars a year. IRS. Yeah. Well, and, and I would. Th- but yeah. as an investor, that's yeah. not necessarily the case. You can be an yeah, and, and thirty six is probably an old number. We should we should probably talk about that. <laughs> but as as your as your business, basically, what you want to do is look at your business, and if you can argue the gray area, you're safe. Um, so uh, basically, what you're trying to do is you're taking the the reasonable, in my opinion, most minimum salary you can, because what's going to happen is you're going to have to pay self-employment tax on that. That's another gotcha. It's not an income tax, it's self-employment tax. But the nice thing about that is, is once you are an S-corp, that minimum salary is the only piece of that income that gets the self-employment tax. And then anything else is a distribution, a dividend to the owners of the S-corp. The shareholders for our, in our case, it's Mike and myself are the shareholders, and that is only taxed at your standard income tax rate. So it doesn't have any other capital gains, any other self-employment tax. So that's like the first little bit as you start making money to look at on, on just entity structure where you can save 7.2% on your, you know, self-employment tax right off the top on say 70, 80, 90% of your income. Yeah. And and I believe this might have changed, but back when I was working for myself doing some freelance stuff, the threshold for where it makes sense to become an S Corp was like about eighty five thousand dollars a year. Eighty five thousand dollars a year. So um, you know, like once you get above that, it kind of makes sense because you're gonna be saving more money um paying out that dividend structure yeah. than you are. Yeah. Um and well, like bouncing out that plus the additional cost to file those taxes and other yeah. things, it makes more sense to go that structure versus just paying yourself the self-employment tax. Yeah. Yeah. And to be, to be clear to that, that you're quoting that $85,000 or whatever, that's net income, not, not gross. It's not your total revenue. It's, it's after, um, it right. would be after your expenses. So if you're a wholesale business, all your marketing expenses, all your software services, that's going to come out of that. And then below that would be what Mike is quoting, which is probably about reasonable. That's kind of where I, I kind of just, yeah. just anchor it or buoy it down at like a hundred grand. If you're going to make hundred grand wholesaling, which is not hard to do, um, you probably should look at doing the S corp election you're, and your accountant will help you. Everybody's situation is a little different, but that's pretty standard to do for a lot of folks. Not everybody does it, but that it worked for us. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. And the key point there. Yeah, an definitely not an accountant. Okay. So, uh, so what's the next, um, what's the cool. next tax Step. savings? Ooh, this one everybody talks about, but this one, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this one. Just depreciation in general. Um, it, especially mm-hmm. if you're doing like wholesaling as a side hustle and all of a sudden you realize you made 300 grand in, in a year, like you should probably be buying some properties, you know? Yeah. But, but, but in order, in order to get anything with depreciation, you have to be it's called a real estate professional. Uh, no, Otherwise you can you can't use like, to offset Yeah, that's a great point. So, you can use passive losses, which depreciation would be technically considered a loss uh, um, on your P&L um, against passive gains. So, if it's a rental property and you say you had 7200 in depreciation, but your net income from that was 10,000 you can you can write off seven thousand of that. Now you got to pay taxes on three thousand. If if it goes the other way, and say you had a bunch of expenses and a large depreciation through like accelerated depreciation, all that, and say your income was only ten grand, but your losses were thirteen, you can only take ten thousand dollars of losses against that because it's passive income versus passive losses. And then that three k of additional losses just carries forward to the next year, so you still accumulate those. But to your point, real estate professional, now what you can do with that 13,000 loss is okay. Writes off all your passive loss. And then the additional 3000 starts writing off your active gains. So say you had wholesale business profits, that's considered an active business or your W2 income is an active business. So that $3,000 loss actually will go and start writing that down as well. Correct. Yeah. But you, not anyone can just go and become a real estate this professional is true. through our requirements and, and how, like what that looks like for the individual. Yep. And I believe it's, what, you can me wrong, I, I think it's, you have to have spend 750 hours mm-hmm. for the year on your real estate yep. business. 
Um, and if you have another form of income, such, such as a W-2 job, you have to spend more time doing that real estate business versus yes. your W-2 yep. job. So a W-2 job, say you're full-time, that's 2,080 hours on average. You know, that's what a full-time is usually considered. You'd have to work 2,081 hours in real estate, which means you'd have to essentially be working 80, 80 hours a week, which I can tell you from experience, yep. that's definitely possible. Um, the, the, <laughs> key, the key to that is that you need to be able to track it. So things that I do just to be safe, I have a mileage app. So if I'm driving around doing real estate stuff, it's tracking it. And then I can say, no, nope, this is where I was going. This is what I was doing because I, and I like about the app I use is it talks about the drive. It shows the drive time as well. And then you need to track any meetings you have. So a calendar, if you use like, you know, your Google calendar or whatever, if you have meetings, which you're going to have that all scheduled in there, then you can track it. And mm -hmm. you'd su be surprised if you're going full-time into real estate, how quickly you can track that. I mean, even analyzing deals, just track it. If you're analyzing an, a deal a day and takes you an hour, that's seven hours a week right there. So, I mean, whether you're working at W2 or not, um, you know, there's some risk associated with it. A major risk is proving that you worked 750 hours or exceeded your other W2 income. Uh, and that's how you de-risk it. Just prove it to the IRS. P tell me that I didn't work. 80 hours a week. Tell me I didn't work 750 hours a year or whatever it is. Yeah. Cause I can show you that I did, but that's huge. Yeah. Well, and then, yeah. And, and then what's something that gets kind of interesting with that as well is because those tax savings can be so massive. If you are, have a very high real estate income that we see this actually pretty often with, with guys in, in go abundance or similar things where they have a W2 job that pays them like, you know, a decent wage, like 80, $110,000 a year. Um, but then they have a real estate business where they make like several hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And at one point, some point it's going to cross a threshold where it no longer makes sense to work your W-2 job necessarily because realistically the tax savings that you're going to get could potentially be more than your yep. total income on yep. your job. You know, so, and it, it can take a while to get there, but that's not a crazy impossible thing, especially if you've been building a portfolio, you've been running a real estate business for a while yeah. and you have some momentum. Um, so, I mean, like I, I'd be curious to know what that ratio would kind of look like, but it like the, the tax savings that you get are, are one of the pillars of, you know, your total internal rate of return on your real mm -hmm. estate. And it shouldn't be discounted. I mean, like people sell syndications yes. to super high income individuals with the tax appreciation being like their number yep. one. Sales. Yeah, there's some you know, where they'll set it up yeah. where you can get a higher percentage of the of the losses from depreciation and just general losses and no income from that mm -hmm. investment that year. Because when you're at that high tax bracket, right. that's huge. That's in, that's that's important to be able to write off. And maybe you had a huge capital gain on a different sale of something. Maybe you sold your business, have a huge capital gain, and you'd rather put that money where somewhere where you can just scrape out tons of losses to avoid tax burden. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because you get some level if you're, you know, even paying retail on a, on a property that's going to cash flow yep. nothing, but your alternative is spending that half million dollars you just spent and sending it yep. to the government. Exactly. I mean, why would you not yep. do that? Right. And at least it's tied to an asset and it's still tied to mm -hmm. your net worth and you get something from yep. it at some point. Um, but that capital gains, though, is a good segue to kind of the last point we we're going to talk about, which is the like kind 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. Or what we're exploring right now is a reverse 1031 exchange, which is the yep. same concept. Um, so do yeah, you want to dive yeah, into that? dive into the requirements. Way? Let's let's hear it. I want to hear what the, what the what is the 1031 yeah. exchange, Mike? So so a 1031 exchange, say like kind asset exchange. Basically, what that means is it's you know it's an IRS. I don't want to say loophole. It's a policy where you can sell one asset. Right. And this is, doesn't just apply to real estate. This can apply to like all kinds of assets. You sell one asset and you take your proceeds and you roll it directly into another asset that is of, it has, it has to have debt of equal to or greater value than the asset you just sold. So basically, you're not actually realizing any true gains on it. Um, and uh, you have a time window to do it. So basically, after you sell that first asset, you have 45 days from the day that it sells. Do you identify a new asset that you're going to buy? And after you identify it, you have 180 days from that date of identification to closing on that asset. Mm. So like, let's say that you were going to sell a property and the closing date was, you know, May 
uh, let's say May 31st, you'd have until the middle of July to identify the new property. And then you'd have six months after that to close on it. And it's a very common strategy for people to avoid capital gains and also to avoid what's called depreciation recapture. So if you do what we were talking about before, where you're using all this depreciation to save on your taxes, I mean, the IRS is let you get away with it forever. If you do that for a bunch of properties and you go to sell them, if you were to sell that property after doing all that depreciation, they come back to you and say, cool, all those taxes we let you waive, we yes. want that money. Yeah. So if you buy like a right? so, $200,000 property, uh, straight line depreciation, 27 and a half years is how they do it. That's you divide that $200,000 less the land that they, they usually, you can't depreciate the land. Um, I think it's like say 7,000. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm doing quick math. See yeah. $7,000 a year. So you, if you held that property for 27.5 years, it's now in the eyes of the IRS worth zero because you've depreciated it. Mm-hmm. And when you go to sell it, they're going to want not just the gains above what you paid for it, but all of that 27.5 years of $7,000 a year that they gave you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Of all the tax. Exactly. Right. And so doing a 1031 exchange allows you to avoid the capital gains tax on the property as well as the depreciation mm-hmm. recapture. And one of the big things with the 1031 exchange as well is when you roll over properties like that, those gains are not required to be paid through yes. death. Or through, Your kids, um, it goes right up to what they, what they call up the step up basis. Right. And so when you yep. die, yeah. say that property you bought was worth 200,000 when you bought it, you depreciate it to zero. You died. It's now worth a half a million. Your kids can sell that and get a half a million. I'm sure there's probably some limits, but half a million in tax free money, which is super yeah. cool. That it, is exa- really cool. It, yep. Exactly. And, and, and so that's, um, it's something that people have been doing for a while. And it's very common amongst like extremely high net worth individuals to, you know, keep scaling up assets, growing cash flow, building more debt, and grow their net worth without necessarily having to pay yep. a tax man anything, right? Um, and then the sort of, I don't want to say like sister, brother, whatever, to 1031 exchange, the reverse 1031 exchange, which we're actually looking at right now. We're buying this little apartment complex. We're closing on it here in about a week. Just over a week, we're going to have to come out like $150,000 is down payment on this thing, right? Um Obviously, we have no properties that are selling in the immediate that we can use to buy that one. So you can't do a normal 1031, but you can do what's called a reverse 1031, which is basically the opposite, where you buy mm. the asset first and then you sell other assets after the fact to basically roll the money into that asset that you just bought. But because you already bought it, basically the money just rolls back to you and you get to take that money tax free because you're claiming it as you know, you did a reverse 1031 on the subject property and the timelines are the same. So after we close on our little apartment, we're going to have 45 days to identify the properties we're going to sell. We have what three flips in motion Mm -hmm. right now. So we'll identify those ones and then we will sell those properties after that 45 days of 180 days to sell those properties. And once they sell, then we'll basically be able to collect all that money tax free without having to you know, pay all the normal taxes we would as if we which makes a ton of sense when you're in the business that we're in, right? It, you know, we're always flipping something. We're always buying something yeah. for ourselves, right? Like when I say always, you know, monthly, we're doing something in acquisitions and dispositions of our business. Um, and so there's a good way, you know, a lot of times you think about it as well, I only 1031 my rental properties, or mm-hmm. I only flip for revenue for my personal income. Well, if you're buying, you throw in the the wrench into that of I buy properties too for cash flow. Well, now if you're going to sell a flip and you got to put money into this deal, right? You, you're you're just stepping it up and making sure, of course, you meet the requirements. But it's like now, how do you hack that tax system to not have to pay taxes, the large short term capital gains that you would typically pay? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, that's the whole game, right? Mm-hmm. Just trying to figure out how to pay as few taxes as possible while being able to get as much equity, debt, and cash flow accumulate as many assets as you can, because that is one of the biggest advantages of being a real estate investor. And, you know, because it is a high leverage, high risk sort of business. Um, And because real estate investors do create a lot of opportunity for societies in terms of like other jobs, in terms of housing, in terms of just like, you know, general well-being of economies, the government does want to encourage people to continue to invest. Absolutely. You know, versus like, if, you, if you're a company that just sells widgets and you're just purely cash 
cash revenue producing heavy business, they'll tax the hell out of you. <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know, yeah. even if you are, you know, providing um, opportunities and jobs and things like that. I mean, when you're just collecting cash, like that's easy for them to collect, right? But if it's all tied up in equity and you're creating stability in different areas, I mean, that's what the government ultimately yep. wants for places to be stable. So they'll reward people. That are right. And remember, them. remember during the last election when the big thing was, was Biden's going to take away the 1031. He's going to take it away. I haven't heard that since he got elected. <laughs> <laughs> right. Honestly. Well, because they all, they all hold exactly. real estate, you know, like, like all, all those dudes, real estate is the number one wealth generating thing out there. Right. You know, you, you own a bunch of real estate. It goes up in value over time. You can get, especially over the past years, you're able to get cheap debt. It's going to get paid down mm-hmm. over a long period of time. You know, it's it's not like the thing with real estate. It's not like a get rich quick game, but it's like a get rich guaranteed yes. game. Yep. Honestly, and well, if you just start taking action and you just wait, like what do they say? Don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate. Mm-hmm. Wait. You know, you, you do that with a shit ton of properties, and I guarantee you, and buy them at a discount. Yeah, buy yep. them at a discount, even better. Um, so yeah. So speaking of which, if you want to learn how to buy discounted real estate and you want to learn how to have these kind of problems where you really do need to worry about taxes, you should check out the instant investment, instant investor program.com. And Dan and I will teach you exactly how we started doing that. And we got to spend our days trying to figure out how to pay less taxes than we used to make. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, instant investor program.com is our group coaching program. Uh, we'd love to, uh, see some of you guys on there. So go ahead and check that website out and book a call. We'll see if you're a good fit. Besides that, you can follow us on socials. I'm at Mike underscore invest on Instagram. Dan is at investor man, Dan. And then if you want a, uh, a freebie that we've been giving away, um, we have our calculator tool that we use to analyze every deal that we go to determine if it is truly discounted and what it's going to take to be able to make some money off of it. So if you go to collectingkeyspodcast.com slash calculator, you can download that there. And then anything else, Dan? I think that's it. I think we're good. I think we can sign off. Cool. All right. Sign us off. Sign us off. Uh, Investor man Dan signing off. I will see you guys next time. Look out for the tax man because he's out there. It's like the, it's like the boogeyman (laughs) coming for you. I, I like how every time you know you're gonna have a send off and you still left I, I know. thought you almost you almost had a good one like two weeks ago. Almost. I'm gonna practice. If anybody knows, like give me I need some coaching on my send off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I wonder if Jason Drees well, is available. Well, I can call him and see if he'll give me some yeah, some coaching on and, really specific one, coaching on podcast send offs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, yeah, if you are going to follow us on Instagram too, go find Dan at Investor Man Dan and shoot him a congratulations on his new kid that he will have by the time. Oh, I will. Out. Yes. Always. Life's going to get crazy yeah. again. He will 100%. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, if it starts being real, uh, real tired. Sound like <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at CollectingKeysPodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.